Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India friends welcome to the class of public international law the lecture third that we will discuss is on law of treaties i am dr ashutosh acharya senior assistant professor law center 2 faculty of law university of delhi well friends in the last lecture we talked about sources of international law and as i had told you one of the most important modern source of international law is law of treaties or you can say treaties conventions being the most important source of law. Now what is the law that governs treaties? We had understood in the last class in brief that there may be bilateral or multilateral treaties. Treaties are based on consent. It is based on Pacta Sint Servanda, that is pacts must be respected, followed. Then how are these treaties governed? What are the rules and regulations that govern a particular treaty? What all types of treaties can be signed, cannot be signed? Can a treaty be signed to commit an act of aggression? against another state? Well, certainly there is, there is mushrooming of treaties. A lot of treaties are signed to fulfill humanitarian purposes, purposes pertaining to trade, economy and what not. But the formation of these treaties, the implementation of these treaties how are these things governed? What is the law pertaining to writing a particular treaty? What is the law pertaining to binding character of a particular treaty? What is the law pertaining to withdrawal of a treaty, withdrawal of obligations from treaty, suspension of a treaty, termination of a treaty? All of these nuances pertaining to law of treaties will be discussed in today's lecture. The learning objectives of today's class would be to understand the rules of treaty law, to learn how treaties are finalized, what is the method or what is the process and as far as understanding rules of treaty law is concerned, we will look at the law pertaining to the rules of treaty law. Thirdly, to learn how states can secure their interest while they sign a treaty. Certainly friends, we know that when states negotiate to sign a particular treaty, no state will just or merely sign a treaty because everybody else is signing or because my neighboring state has signed or a friendly state has signed or it peripherally looks to be very beneficial, a treaty has to be well read with, all the possible outcomes of obligations and rights are to be understood. Experts from the different states or a particular state will look at the treaty provisions very minutely, efficiently, so that in future they do not end up taking up obligations which are not in their favor, which are disadvantageous to their position as far as legal binding character of treaty or its provision is concerned. It should not be a situation where a state is a standing at a point where it is legally bound to accept the obligation. At the same time, that treaty is completely disadvantageous or turn out to be completely disadvantageous for that particular state. So, for the, all these reasons, we see 
that when a treaty is signed by a state, all the states while they enter into negotiation, they take time and they ensure themselves that a particular treaty is not a violative or is not against or is disadvantageous to their interest. So, therefore, we learn how states can secure their interest while they sign a particular treaty. What is the remedy? What is the passage? What are the methods given in the law to safeguard one's interest as far as a particular treaty signing or acceptance is concerned? To understand different stages of treaty signing, to learn the legal implications of the signature, accession or ratification of treaty. Why do I write it differently? Because all of them have different implications, different understandings. Signature depending on a treaty might have a finalized effect, might not have a finalized effect. Accession has a different effect. Ratification, if it is necessary, is a separate process that has to be undertaken as far as acceptance of a particular treaty is concerned. So, there are different steps, we will understand all those steps as well. When and where are they necessary to be followed, if they are necessary to be followed. Now, when I say law of treaties, what is the law of treaties? What is that particular law of treaties? Well, it is Vienna Convention on Law of Treaties 1969 that tells us in detail that what are the rules that should be followed as far as making of treaty is concerned, acceptance of obligations through treaty is concerned, consent is concerned, termination is concerned, suspension is concerned, etcetera. So, all the rules holistically pertaining to a treaty are given or can be found in Vienna Convention on Law of Treaties 1969, shortly termed as or abbreviated as VCLT 1969. It was adopted in 1969, it came into force in 1980, 116 states have ratified this particular convention drafted by International Law Commission. It has various chapters that includes different subject matters as far as law of treaty is concerned. The convention applies only to written treaties between the states. The first part of the document defines the terms and the scope of the agreement. Friends, if you remember when we were discussing sources of international law, it said international conventions recognized by the states. So, it has to be an international convention or an agreement we may say which is recognized by the states. And once it is recognized either through signature, accession or ratification or acceptance, then it becomes legally binding upon that particular state. So, the convention applies only to written treaties between states because it has to be ex expressly accepted. We still go back to Article 38 of International Court of Justice Statute. We will see it says expressly accepted. So, therefore, only written treaties between states. The first part of the document defines the terms and the scope of the agreement. So, as far as VCLT is concerned, the first part defines the terms and the scope. We will go through it. Second part lays out the rules for the conclusion and adoption of treaties including the consent of parties to be bound by treaties and formulation of reservations. That is declining to be bound by one or more particular provisions of a treaty while accepting the rest. Reservation is the method through which a state can save its certain interest. If a state is willing to be part of a particular treaty, 
but is not willing to be part and parcel of certain obligation or obligations, is not willing to accept certain obligation, is not happy or considers a certain provision to be disadvantageous to its interests, then in such situations it may reserve that particular provision. So, it is a way in which the states can be promoted to be part of a particular treaty while securing their interests. So, we will discuss how this system of reservation works in detail. Further, the third part deals with the application and interpretation of treaties and the fourth part discusses means of modifying or amending treaties. Friends, it is not that once a treaty has been signed, it will continue in totality in the same wording. As times change, scenarios change, situations change, there might be requirement of certain modifications to be brought into picture as far as treaties are concerned. Treaties also become old and with the passage of time, they require newness due to the newness in situation and circumstances. So, therefore, a certain times modifications are required, moderations are required, alterations are required and for this there is a provision given mentioned under VCLT 1969. These parts essentially codify existing customary law. So, if you look at VCLT, it comes up with certain new provisions as far as the making formation of the treaty is concerned, end of treaty is concerned, amendment of treaties are concerned, etcetera, including acceptance of obligations. Largely, these provisions represent already existing practice. So, once you codify, it becomes clear. Once you do not codify, or till the time you do not codify, the practice can be diverged or the practice may be avoided by certain states. In that situation, there will be dispute and that dispute will have to be adjudged by international court and then court will de determine that whether a particular obligation was in existence with respect to a treaty or not in existence with respect to a treaty. So, multiple questions may come into picture, whereas codification simplifies things, it makes things more certain, it brings objectivity to the law of treaties. You need not rely on certain practices, past practices and still be in confusion and doubt as to whether a particular practice is a still applicable, whether a particular state is bound by a particular practice or not bound by a particular practice. So, in order to remove any kind of subjectivity, law of treaties when codified makes it certain, makes it clear that what are the legal obligations that can be followed, that are to be followed as far as signing, ratifying, exceeding, modification, change, termination, consent, etcetera are concerned. When can a state avoid legal obligation in a particular treaty? What are the circumstances in which a state may be allowed to avoid to follow or to abide by its legal obligation under international legal system. So, VCLT is a basic document to understand the nuances of formation of treaty or any legal aspect concerning or pertaining to treaty. The most important part of the convention, part 5, which delineates grounds and rules for invalidating terminating or suspending treaties and includes a provision granting the International Court of Justice jurisdiction in the event of disputes arising from the application of those rules. Now, friends, if you look at the preface or preamble of the VCLT 1969, it says that the state parties to the present convention Considering the fundamental role of treaties in the history of international relations. So, firstly, it considers VCLT's fundamental role 
or fundamental role of treaties. So, what important role has been played by treaties in general? So, treaties are so important in today's time and in the past also have been so important, which can be helpful in determining, in clarifying legal obligations. So, as we say and as we see also that legal positivism codification has led to establishment of certainty in legal system. The more, the cert more certain the law is, the less confusion and doubt it will entail and therefore, treaties are a form of international codified law and cumulatively they form codified legal system and therefore, to bring clarity in law and legal system, treaties have played a fundamental role. So, therefore, considering the fundamental role of treaties in the history of international relations, recognizing the ever increasing importance of treaties. Now, once you have a clear identified determined international obligation and right in the written form, the better the laws are, the better laws are uh, in a codified manner or are objectified or are more clear, it brings clarity within the relationship of states. The more the confusion, the more the subjectivity, it will lead to less favorable advantageous relationship between states. So, treaties play an important role, a fundamental role primarily in upbringing good international relations amongst states. And friends, it is very necessary to have states good international relations. If they lack in good international relations, they will ultimately lead to breach of peace or they might lead to confusion amongst states that can lead to devastations, destructions and what not. So, extreme outcomes may come into being if there is lack of clarity amongst the states. So, in order to avoid all of these negative aspects of international relations or prevailing in international relations, treaties play a significant role as an important tool to bring clarity and remove ambiguity from legal obligations and establish good international relations. Therefore, secondly recognizing the ever increasing importance of treaties as a source of international law and as a means of developing peaceful cooperation among nations, whatever their constitutional and social systems. So, we recognize that there are different and divergent social systems, there are different divergent legal systems existing in different states. But having a common platform, having a common law at international scenario can avoid all or any or different kind of conflict or dispute situations amongst the states. We also note that the principles of free consent and of good faith and the Pactus and Sarvanda rule are universally recognized. So, VCLT notes that the principles of free consent is in existence. Friends, as I have already told you that the law of treaties or treaties in general are based on consent. Without consent, no state can be forced to sign an international treaty. So, content form, consent forms the basis, also good faith forms the basis and at the same time Pactus and Sarvanda forms the basis which are universally recognized principles. Affirming that disputes concerning treaties like other international disputes should be settled by peaceful means and in conformity with the principles of justice and international law. VCLT also affirms that disputes concerning treaties like other international disputes be settled by peaceful means and in conformity with the principles of justice and international law. Recalling further the determination of the peoples of United Nations to establish conditions under which justice and respect 
or the obligations arising from treaties can be maintained. Having in mind the principles of international law embodied in the Charter of United Nations, such as the principles of the equal rights and self-determination of peoples, of the sovereign equality and independence of all states, of non-interference in the domestic affairs of the states, of the prohibition of the threat or use of force and of universal respect for and observance of human rights and fundamental freedoms for all. Believing that the codification and progressive development of the law of treaties achieved in the present convention will promote the purposes of the United Nations set forth in the Charter, namely the maintenance of international peace and security, the development of friendly relations and the achievement of cooperation among nations, affirming that the rules of customary international law will continue to govern questions not regulated by the provisions of the present convention. So, if you look at the preface, it recognizes United Nations Charter, the basic tenets and principles of United Nations Charter, the aims and objectives being the maintenance of international peace and security. Treaties can play a significant role in maintenance of peace and security. States can be obliged to conduct themselves in a legally binding manner so that they do not involve themselves in such acts and behavioral patterns that leads to disturbing the international peace and security. It also criticizes the or I identifies the effect of breach of peace, threat to peace and act of aggression and how treaties can play a significant role as far as such non-acceptable acts are concerned. Now friends, let us discuss the definition of law of treaties or article 2 where use of terms have been mentioned. Article 2 identifies the definition of different terms that are used in the Vienna Convention on Law of Treaties 1969. First being under clause 1 sub clause A, treaty and it says, treaty means an international agreement concluded between states in written form and governed by international law. I repeat, treaty means an international agreement concluded between the states in written form. As I have already told you that it has to be expressly mentioned and governed by international law. So, whatever treaty you sign, whatever treaties the states sign must be governed by the general international law. Whether embodied in a single instrument or in two or more related instruments and whatever its particular designation. So, treaty is basically nothing but an international agreement which has to be expressly mentioned. It may be embodied in a single instrument or in two or more related instruments. It may have addendums, annexures, etcetera or it may be signed in different parts. Subclause B defines ratification, acceptance, approval and accession which cumulatively would mean in each case the international act so named whereby a state establishes on the international plane its consent to be bound by a treaty. So, through these four methods consent to be bound by a treaty can be obtained. However, these are merely parts of different processes where we use these terms differently. So, in a particular process we may use a ratification, in another different process we may use accession, in another different process we may use signature. So, depending on the process that has been adopted by the states, concerned states that are signing the treaty, these words may be used, but cumulatively it shows consent. 
sub clause C talks about full powers. Well, friends, you will understand that not every time all the uh, people representing the state at international fora will represent the state. At different places, at different types of treaties, depending on the subject matter, different representatives or representative may be sent to accept the treaty, to discuss the treaty, to negotiate the treaty. But when this person is sent to sign a particular treaty, that particular person must have power that is full power to represent the state. It has huge obligation, it has huge responsibility upon its shoulders where it is representing the state. Therefore, full power has to be there as far as signing or ratifying of any document is concerned. It says full powers means a document emanating from the competing authority of a state designating a person or persons to represent the state for negotiating, adopting or authenticating the text of a treaty, for expressing the consent of the state to be bound by a treaty or for accomplishing any other act with respect to a treaty. So, basically full powers is given to a person who is representing the state and these are endowed upon him or her by a competent authority. The person must carry a document bearing full powers. The person must be in the capacity to have the full power. How will you identify that whether a particular person is having a full power or not? Two ways can be there. One, the person is carrying a document bearing full power as I have already told you. Second, the internal law can also define and identify that who all will have the authority to provide full power to person or who all can have or bear powers to represent a state outside the state, negotiate on behalf of the state, finalize a treaty on behalf of the state. So, either internal law or a notified person can have full powers. Article 7 of the um, Vienna Convention on Law of Treaties deals with full powers. Subclause D talks about reservation, which means a unilateral statement, however phrased or named, made by a state when signing, ratifying, accepting, approving or acceding to a treaty, whereby it purports to exclude or modify the legal effect of certain provisions of the treaty in their application to that state. The next is subclause E negotiating state, which means a state which took part in the drawing up and adoption of the text of the treaty. Now, there may be states that has not taken part, part in or has not participated while the treaty was being negotiated. There are states that become part of the treaty after negotiation has happened, after treaty has been finalized or after treaty has come into force for the relevant states. So, negotiating states are the states that took part in the negotiation process. Subclause F talks about contracting state, which means state which has consented to be bound by the treaty, whether or not the treaty has entered into Force. So, whosoever has consented to be through any means has consented to be part of the treaty would be known as contracting state. Subclause G, party, which means a state which has consented to be bound by the treaty and for which the treaty is in force. Subclause H, third state, means a state not a party to the treaty. Subclause I, International organization means an intergovernmental organization and not any other type of organization. Clause 2 of Article 2 says the provisions of paragraph 1 regarding the use of the terms in the present convention are without prejudice to the use of those terms or to the meanings which may be given to them in internal law of any state. So, it makes very clear, the clause 2 makes it clear that if 
the internal law of a particular state is having a particular meaning given to any of the words that have been defined here under article 2 clause 1 and it contradicts with the meaning given in article 2 clause 1 of the VCLT 1961-69, then article 2 clause 1 will prevail or the meaning given under article 2 clause 1 will prevail. Internal law cannot be used an excuse or the meaning of the word cannot be used which is mentioned in the internal law. So, a state having a different meaning in its own internal law cannot be used in confrontation with the meaning of the word given in 2 clause 1. 27, article 27 of the VCLT 1969 clearly says that states cannot use internal law as an excuse to avoid any international obligation and in, as an extension to it we see here under 2 clause 2 that if there are two different meanings for a state, one given in the internal law and the other one given in 2 clause 1 of ECLT 1969, the given the meaning given in 2 clause 2, 2 clause 1 of the VCLT 1969 will prevail. How treaties are made? What is the step or what are the steps for the formation of a treaty? Well, friends, there are there is no single process that can be used or that is used for making a treaty. A treaty can be concluded by any process that a state wishes to adopt. Treaties may be concluded in any manner parties wishes or wish. Sometimes treaties wait for a draft, after the draft comes into being, they negotiate on the draft, sometimes they come up with a new draft, if there are major changes, if there are no major changes, then they will go ahead with certain changes, minor changes, minute changes in the draft. Once negotiation is concluded, they may sign the treaty, they may allow the states to go for ratification also. They may not allow the states to go for ratification. So, whether a treaty will come into force merely by signing the treaty or it will come into force only after ratification, whether accession will be allowed, it will not be allowed, if it is allowed, what will be the process and the method as far as accession is concerned, all of which is left to the parties or is left upon the states who are signing the treaty or ratifying the treaty. It may be drafted between states or government departments or head of states or government departments whichever appears most expedient. So, there is complete freedom and liberty as far as conclusion of a treaty is concerned. Important treaties are signed by the head of the state and many mundane treaties by government departments, example minor trading agreements. Power to make treaties is to be found upon each country's municipal regulations and varies from state to state. So, for example, in England it is the crown and in USA it is the president. And in India, since India being is a dualist state, any treaty at least of public nature, not of private nature, at least a treaty that concerns public subject matters are to be ratified by the parliament. So, different approaches are undertaken. Once a treaty draft is finalized, consent is to be obtained from the states so that they can accept the obligations and rights mentioned in the treaty. They are part of performance as far as that treaty is concerned. How do you obtain consent? Consent can be obtained by different methods. There are largely four to five methods through which consent can be obtained as far as any international treaty or convention is concerned. So, we will go through it one by one. The first one is consent by signature. The consent of a state to be bound by a treaty is expressed by the signature 
of its representative when the treaty provides that signature shall have that effect. So, treaty has to specifically mention that merely putting a signature by the person having full powers will amount to giving consent that means acceptance of the provisions come including obligations and rights mentioned in that treaty. So, once signature is done or signature is placed on the documents of the treaty by the person representing the state, the treaty is concluded for that particular state, then the state is bound then by that particular treaty or if it says that it will come into force from a certain particular date, then from on that on from that date onwards it will come into force once signature has been placed as far as the document of that particular treaty is concerned. Sub clause B, it is otherwise established that the negotiating states were agreed that signature should have that effect or the intention of the state to give that effect to the signature appears from the full powers of its representative or was expressed during the negotiation. So, there either has to be express mention or the intention of the parties was such that merely putting a signature or placing a signature will result into conclusion of a treaty acceptance of the obligations of the treaty. Article 18 says effect of signature where ratification required, it says or it deals with matter or legal implication where it is mandatory for a state to ratify. Now, ratification is not a mandatory process as we have seen under article 12 that signature individually can have the same effect that a ratification will have or accession will have, acceptance will have, approval will have. But sometimes if a state wishes to have a second thought or a states cumulatively decide that we must have ratification as a process of acceptance. We principally agree that yes, the draft that is placed before us is acceptable. However, there are certain problems with respect to acceptance of certain provisions by certain states. Certain provisions, certain states, majorly or in principally all of the concerned states or most of the states agree or are on agreeable terms as far as that treaty is concerned or treaty provisions are concerned. But if they want to rethink or if they want to go back to their own state and discuss again and reconsider the idea of signing the convention or a treaty, they want to replace their interests before the committee comprising of drafting the treaty or the states that are involved in the signing process or formation of the treaty. If they want to convey their own interest, if they want to rethink, then they may have ratification as a secondary process of acceptance apart from signature being the first one. Sometimes approval by parliament in the internal law also functions as a ratification. Once you have accepted in your internal law, then it is deemed and it is very much clear that you have accepted the treaty. Now, complex situation comes into being when a state has signed the treaty but has not ratified the treaty. That means it is sitting upon the finalization of the treaty. What will be the effect of putting merely a signature and not ratifying it? Can the state avoid the obligations mentioned in the treaty even if it has signed the treaty? The answer is yes. If ratification is a process is still pending on, on the part of the state who has signed it. In such a situation, though that particular state is still bound by the objects and purposes of the treaty, it is still cannot go against the objects and purposes of the treaty. So, that is the effect of signing the treaty. It may not be bound by specific obligations and provisions of the treaty since the ratification is still awaited, but it is still bound by the objects and purposes of the treaty. The second method through which 
acceptance can be or consent can be shown is by consent by exchange of instruments mentioned under article 13. Earlier when signing a treaty, preparing a draft etcetera was not that much uh, prevalent or two uh, leaders of the state or head of the states cannot come together or even if they have come together just as a matter of practice or sign the head of the states or person bearing full powers used to exchange documents. Even today as a matter of show and as a matter of display, two head of the states exchange instruments. So, when they exchange instruments either for memorandum of understanding or for a particular treaty, it is a sign that they accept the obligations in principle. So, this is also a method through which consent can be displayed and then is consent by ratification under article 14 of ECLT. Now, I have already explained you about ratification as a process, but then there are certain states, there are certain proponents who favor the process of ratification whereas certain others oppose the process of ratification. There are benefits to ratification, there are also disadvantages to process of ratification. What is the benefit of ratification? Reconsideration of the treaty in question that you can reconsider the treaty as I have told you. So, you can go back to your own home state, reconsider it, take into account all of the interests whether all of your interests are satisfied or not and then accordingly ratify or not ratify, take a specific obligation or not to take a specific obligation. So, these are the certain benefits. Dualist states generally follow this particular trend that is dualist states often require internal approval legislation by the act of parliament. For example, UK as a rule that is every treaty has to be placed 21 days before the parliament of UK before ratification. So, this rule is placed in UK and many other states which belong to common law system and has adopted dualist position and ratification as an essential requirement to be placed as far as acceptance of treaty is concerned. But then apart from this benefit there is a disadvantage, is, or disadvantage. What is the disadvantage? The disadvantage is that the treaty is not reconsidered. It may be signed once and for all all the provisions without taking into account all of your interest may come into your baggage. So, you might end up accepting a treaty which is less beneficial for the state. So, there are benefits at the same time there are disadvantages. Ratification prolongs the process of signing a treaty. So, this is another disadvantage that we see as far as ratification, acceptance of a particular treaty is concerned. Article 15 talks about consent by accession. If a state was not part of the initial negotiation or once the treaty was concluded and or let us say have come into force, then the particular state has the option of acceding to it. The treaty will provide a provision of accession. If the treaty bars accession, then a particular state cannot become part of that particular treaty. This is possible only if treaty so provides or the negotiating states agree. So, the method of accession will be mentioned in the treaty and that particular method will be followed as far as acceptance of a treaty is concerned. Article 17, consent to be bound by part of a treaty and cho choice of differing provisions. So, a treaty can provide liberty, not necessarily, but it may provide a liberty that you can become part of certain provisions of the treaty and not all the provisions of the treaty. You may accept certain obligations and may not accept certain other obligations. A similar kind of situation can also be witnessed in reservation as well, where the states can reserve certain articles and when I say they can reserve certain articles, I mean to say here that those reserved provisions will not be applicable upon them those reserved or those reserved obligations will not be applicable on those states. They will be exempted from those obligations. So, reservation to treaties, it, ex it exclude or modify the legal effect of certain provisions of the treaty in their application to that state. The capacity of a state to make reservation to an international treaty illustrates the principle of sovereignty 
of states. Now, once you reserve certain provision that will not be applicable on you or the obligation will not be applicable upon you, there are certain positive aspects that comes into picture and then there are certain negative aspects that comes into picture or it may come into picture. The positive aspect is it encourages harmony amongst states of widely differing social, economic and political systems by concentrating on agreed basic issues and accepting disagreements. Now, whenever a treaty allows for reservation, so this means that a treaty may choose not to allow reservation also. However, if it allows to have a reservation, then in that particular scenario, it gives a positive impact or lays down positive impact as well. What is the positive impact? It attracts more and more states. More and more states would be willing to participate in that particular treaty because it gives you liberty to not accept all the obligations. Also, it is again dependent on the party, uh, dependent on the treaty that what all provisions are available to be reserved. I repeat that it depends on the treaty whether it has allowed for reservation, if it has allowed for reservation, what all provisions it has allowed for reservation. But in any case, we will see and notice that never a treaty will allow for reservation of its fundamental obligations. Okay. So, if it allows for reservation, it will take care of the situation that it protects its fundamental provisions, fundamental obligations. So, certain other obligations which are not fundamental in character and application may be allowed to be reserved, which may be dependent on social, political, cultural aspects. So, based on these grounds, which may be economic also, the states may be allowed to have reservation in certain treaties. The negative aspect is that the treaty becomes honeycombed with reservations by a series of countries and it could well jeopardize the whole exercise of concluding a treaty. So, once reservation is given, then it becomes honeycombed by certain states accepting reservation, certain states not accepting reservation, certain states coming only on the basis of reservation, certain states not coming into the picture or not becoming part of that particular treaty just because there is no reservation. So, having a provis provision of reservation can be tedious also as far as treaty conclusion is concerned. Now, we can take an example of reservation which comes from Geneva Convention on Continental Shelf 1958. Article 6 talks about reservation or Article 6, if you see, talks about equidistance principle and the convention allowed for reservation, wherein France reserved Article 6. That means, if any dispute with respect to delimitation of continental shelf comes into being, France is not bound by Article 6, that is, it is not bind, bound by the principle of equidistance, that is, it will not divide the water equally, whereas wherever required, it may go for any other principle such as proportionality principle, such as equitable principle to be made applicable as far as delimitation of continental shelf is concerned. Can states make unilateral reservations or as it says, whether unilateral statement made constitutes a reservation, what will happen? if unilaterally, one-sidedly reservation has been made and other states have not accepted it or let us say there are 50 states out of which 10 states have accepted the reservation, 40 states have not accepted the reservation or vice versa, 40 states have accepted but 10 states have not accepted the reservation. What will happen in such a situation? Now, in such a situation, most of the times, if reservation is allowed, if the treaty is very liberal as far as reservation is concerned, the states that have accepted the reservation, they will work and function accordingly. That is, the states that have accepted the reservation and the states that have given the reservation or has placed reservation in such a scenario, the obligation of the state that has argued 
or contended for reservation or has taken the reservation or has excluded the obligation will not be under obligation for these states. But for other states that have not accepted this particular reservation, they may function in reciprocity. That is, this particular state that has not accepted the reservation will not have international legal relationship as far as that particular provision or reservation or treaty provisions are concerned. So, it will work according to the treaty provisions that whether it allows for reservation, what is the legal relationship that will come into being as far as the reservation is concerned. Let us take an example of reservation to the genocide convention case 1957. ICJ in its advisory opinion took a flexible approach and opposed to the restrictive approach. What is the restrictive approach? The restrictive approach would be that if you have reserved, then you will not be able to claim anything, you will not be able to impose responsibility upon other states as far as that particular treaty is concerned. But if it is flexible, then it says, it held that a state which has made and maintained a reservation which has been objected to by one or more parties to the convention, but not by others can be regarded as being a party to the convention, if the reservation is compatible with the object and purpose of the convention. So, it will not, in a flexible approach, it will not take you out of the whole convention or a treaty, it will still make you part of that treaty, but it will function accordingly as the other states do not consider you part of the convention. So, between them different legal relationship will come into being and between the states that have accepted the reservation for them, this state is still a part of the convention. So, you can have two different types of approaches. However, we see that ICJ in genocide convention case taking into account the fundamental importance of the convention since it is based or since it, since it takes into account the subject matter of genocide, it is beneficial or it is advantageous to take a flexible approach. Court in this case did emphasize upon the integrity of the convention, but pointed to variety of special circumstances with regard to convention, which called for more flexible interpretation to the principle. The circumstances included in this particular case, universal character of United Nations under whose auspices the convention had been concluded, the extensive participation envisaged under the convention, convention being the product of majority of votes, the fact that principles underlying the convention were general principles already binding upon states, convention was clearly intended by the United Nations and the parties to be definitely universal in scope and that it had been adopted in purely humanitarian purpose. The flexible approach can also be seen in VCLT 1969 as well. Article 19 says formulation of reservation, a state may when signing, ratifying, accepting, approving or acceding to a treaty formulate a reservation unless the reservation is prohibited by the treaty as I have already told you. The treaty provides that only specified reservations which do not include the reservation in question may be made or in cases not falling under sub paragraphs A and B, the reservation is incompatible with the object and purpose of the treaty. All of this I have already explained. Now, how treaty enters into force, article 24 identifies methods through which treaty enters into force. A treaty enters into force in such manner and upon such date as it may provide or as the negotiating states may agree, failing any such provision or agreement, a treaty enters into force as soon as consent to be bound by the treaty has been established for all the negotiating states. Thirdly, when the consent of a state to be bound by a treaty is established on a date after the treaty has come into force, the treaty enters into force for that state on that date unless the treaty otherwise provides. The provisions of a treaty regulating the authentication of its text, establishment of the consent of a state to be bound by the treaty the manner or date of its entry into force, reservations, the functions of the depository and other matters arising necessarily before the entry into force of the treaty apply from time, from the time of the adoption of its text. Article 80 states after their entry into force treaty should be transmitted to the UN Secretariat for registration and publication. Now, once treaty has come into being, can you invalidate a treaty? Can there be termination and suspension of operation of treaties? The general provision states 
that the validity of a treaty or of the consent of a state to be bound by a treaty may be impeached only through the application of the present convention. So, the convention states the methods or the circumstances under which a treaty can be invalidated, terminated or suspended. The termination of a treaty, its denunciation or the withdrawal of a party may take place only as a result of the application of the provisions of the treaty or of the present convention. The same rule applies to suspension of the operation of a treaty. Severability of treaty provisions, states may only withdraw from or suspend the operation of a treaty in respect of the treaty as a whole and not particular parts of it, unless the treaty otherwise stipulates or the parties otherwise agree. So, you cannot break the treaty and say that I, I will not be bound by, so the reservation is there, but then you cannot suspend or withdraw from the treaty partially unless and until the treaty itself allows for it. What are the grounds for invalidity of treaties? Article 46, 47, 49, 50, 51 and 52 states the grounds for invalidity of treaties, the first one being municipal law. It clearly says that municipal law cannot be the ground of in declaring a treaty invalid unless that violation was manifest and concerned a rule of its internal law of fundamental importance. Error can happen in two situations, whether a state was aware or not aware assuming a circumstance fact to be in existence. Where the state was aware, then you cannot say that it was commission of error as it was claimed in the temple of Previa case by Thailand against Cambodia. Where you were not aware, where the state was not aware, then perhaps error can be claimed. Fraud, article 49 says, if a state has been induced to conclude a treaty by the fraudulent conduct of another negotiating state or through corruption, if the expression of the state's consent to be bound by a treaty has been procured through the corruption of its representative directly or indirectly by another negotiating state, then it can also be ground of invalidating a treaty. Coercion, that is by using force, that is by threat to force or any other act of aggression. If a treaty is forced upon the state to be signed, then it can be declared to be invalid. A treaty is void if its conclusion has been procured by the threat or use of force in violation of the principles of international law embodied in the Charter of the United Nations. If coercion is used against a representative, then that treaty will also have no legal effect. How do we see termination of a treaty, that is end to a treaty? Article 61, 62 and 63 and 64 identifies four situations in which or based upon which a treaty can be terminated. First one being under Article 61, supervening impossibility of performance. A party may invoke the impossibility of performing a treaty as a ground for terminating or withdrawing from it if the impossibility results from the permanent disappearance or destruction of an object indispensable for the execution of the treaty. If the impossibility is temporary, it may be invoked only as a ground for suspending the operation of the treaty. If there is a water treaty, but the water is not more in existence or the river has automatically naturally diverted its route, then the water treaty can be terminated because the subject matter has ended. Similarly, article 62 talks about fundamental change of circumstances. This can be invoked only if the circumstances constituted an essential basis of the consent of the parties to be bound by the treaty and the effect of the change is radically to transform the extent of obligations still to be performed under the treaty. And then article 63, severance of diplomatic or consular relations if the state is declared to be an enemy state in such situations we see termination of treaty can happen. Article 64, emergence of a new peremptory norm of general international law if the acts bound uh, obligated under the treaty upon the states are against use cogens or peremptory norm of international law and it has emerged after the treaty has been signed, then the treaty will be automatically terminated since it is against the peremptory norm of international law. With this, thank you so much for your patient listening. Namaskar.